talk back and forth. But um, there's, there, there are actually so many people down that end, you might want to station yourself more towards the middle. Yes. But okay. uh, after I introduce you, I you will can just start on there. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, it's simply wonderful to have such a full house this evening for a uh, close encounter in which um, I'm delighted to have an opportunity to introduce the speaker who is a colleague and friend at Regis College at the University of Toronto, where we're both studying theology and art. Uh, Claude Mureg um, is doing a PhD on um, um, abstract art, uh, and uh, he did his MA on the problem of evil. Uh, he combines a fascination for art, and a pra uh, 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 he's also a practicing artist with theology, and he um, has many, many other skills. Um, he's he's a, um, a, a, a native of uh, Mexico. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He has a, a Canadian citizenship and French citizenship. <laughs> he speaks many languages and he crosses disciplines. Um, he's one of those uh, people who think very widely on a philosophical level, and he takes on no small uh, projects. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. <laughs> <laughs> and so tonight he's going to look at um, uh, the subject of evil, and he's going to relate it to Delacroix's Faust lithographs, uh, a series that was inspired by a production on the French stage, um, which um, wasn't terribly orthodox, but it gave him enough of a flavor of Goethe's Faust that Goethe himself greatly admired these much maligned lithographs. And Claude will tell you why. So please join me in welcoming Claude to our study center. Thank you. Thank you. So, well, I'm glad Catherine mentioned the fact that I used to get into intellectual troubles, because that is true. Uh, the paper I wrote about evil uh, to graduate from the Masters of Theological Studies actually was, um, I was trying to do a few things. One, of course, understand a little better what evil could be, but oh, yes, the, the paper I wrote uh, on evil, I was trying to understand, the, well, the, I was interested in a few things. One, to understand, of course, a little better evil. But also I wanted to bring to the table several ways of thinking about it, several approaches, and see if I was able to integrate, it, integrate them or create a coherent synthesis of these different disciplines and, uh, and see what, what would lead. You know? Evil is intriguing. It has been studied for millennia. What else can you say these days about evil? So one of the things I found out is that you can say things as long as it's you approaching the topic, you bring new things and new perspectives and, and ways to do what I try to do, which is synthesize the knowledge out there. So at least the exercise is, is worth, worth doing. The, um, the paper uh, was based on three main lines of thinking, uh, which I'm going to use as an inspiration tonight to um, offer a brief survey of what these lines of thinking, thinking are in hopes that uh, I can offer some little bits and pieces and some philosophical devices, if you like, that you can keep and take home and then apply when we turn into a, a, to look at the, at the prints and at the work of Faust and to other instances of evil, of course. So um, that would be one first section, if you will, based on rational argumentation, which are these three lines of thinking I'm going to be... Uh, serving quickly, and then we'll turn to the added benefit that we have and that Catherine and Brenda have allowed us by, by adding the layer of art, where we will be looking into uh, what would be the emotional, the subjective, and uh, the, the, the instinctual side of, uh, of, of all of us. And we'll touch a little bit on, on, on the intellectual environment that was um, occurring around when Delacroix produced these prints because it's what it's called the, the romantic 
period. And it is an incredibly fertile period in the history of art and, and, and of, of uh, thought in general. So um, I think that a good start would be to mention a little bit about contemporary philosophy. What is or what are the latest works uh, of contemporary philosophy doing with the uh, concept of evil? Then I will um, o offer a brief survey of what science says or how science deals uh, with evil. And then uh, we'll look into theology. Of course, from a school of theology, we have to bring that in. But uh, it's also um, very helpful because each area deals with different aspects or slightly different aspects. You'll see that the contemporary philosophy tends to uh, look at things in a very abstract manner, very uh, theoretical and uh, conceptual. The, the scientific line looks at things a little more clinically. They, they have uh, observations of personalities and things that they are trying to make sense of and explain in different terms. And the, um, the theological uh, side of things, they look twofold into our inner selves as humans, but they also uh, contemplate the metaphysical aspect of, of, of existence. So anyway, let's uh, try to give a brief overview and then we'll turn to Faust and we'll use it as a case on which to apply all these bits and pieces of, of information. Can you speak a bit louder, please? Yes, I'll be trying to come both sides anyway. So let's start with philosophy. Um, doing some research, uh, bringing that paper I wrote up to date, I found a couple of works that were uh, one published this same year and um, other few works published in the last five years or, or so. If we have to summarize it, and obviously what I'm going to say is kind of simplifying things, but the, uh, the philosophical approach would, we can say in this instance, they, they take the concept of evil and they try to find out from all the ins instances that you can come up uh, as you could think of something is evil, they take all these instances and they try to distill what is the necessary and the sufficient condition, conditions of all these instances uh, so you can actually, or they deserve to be called evil. So it's a conceptual analysis. The, um, it is very theoretical, and uh, it does yield some interesting results because uh, some sides tend to arrive at definitions of evil, some others don't. It is, very, it is a, one of those things that you can spend an entire life trying to pin down. Um, but they, they do yield interesting results. For instance, they can, one of the works, the most recent one, concluded that evil could be deemed, or an evil personality could be deemed as a result of an evil disposition. It doesn't explain much. <laughs> but uh, they go a little deeper and they say, even, uh, even if the person does not actually do anything or, or, or that disposition is not actualized, for them, in their system of definitions and their conceptual analysis, that defines evil disposition. Also, uh, it is useful in the sense that, for instance, they can prove philosophically that evil is a concept that transcends all kinds of boundaries. It's, uh, it fits perfectly well within a secular society. It does not belong partic to particular religious inclinations or, or, or anything. So, again, these are conclusions that sound simplistic now, but in philosophical debates, they, they have some, some way. Um, I'm going to get into a little more um, substantial things now with the uh, theories of evil from science. Uh, science, as I mentioned, does look at things a little more clinical. Uh, specifically, the lines we're, we're going to be looking at here is a little bit of um, psychology and psychiatry. And we can trace back this, this tradition of thinking to, say, Freud with his uh, theory of the unconscious, where he postulated that the human being had two tendencies, two main instinctual drives. One is towards life, and the other one is towards death. And this, these instincts reside in what he found to be the unconscious. Again, I'm oversimplifying, but... Um, so, uh, if evil would be localized in the, in the individual, science will not be looking at supernatural sources or anything like of that sort. So evil has to reside within the individual and where they place evil or the roots of evil is in the psyche. 
after Freud, for instance, we, um, we have Carl Jung, close collaborator of Freud, who um, he broke off with his theories because he differentiated even further the unconscious. He found out that there's the uh, collective unconscious, that result of evolution. Um, everybody has the same, the same uh, result, let's say. And there's the personal unconscious. In Jung's unconscious, um, there are what he described as archetypes. These are deeply ingrained patterns of behavior that are a result of evolution. And uh, these archetypes, they, they are different. They, they determine things like the relationship between sexes or, they can, or, or, or the maternal uh, relationship with a, with a child. There can be more complex archetypes, like the archetype of a hero that um, it is activated by circumstances, say, like national, um, nationalistic um, matters, stuff like that. Um, there's an infinity of archetypes, but the important thing to note here is that um, for Jung, the healthy development of the person depends on these archetypes from the collective unconscious or the personal unconscious, um, taken up into consciousness, embraced and integrated with other aspects of the personality. The archetypes that do not do this stay in what he calls the shadow, and this is the place where the wild drives uh, linger. Uh, that would be the root of evil for, for uh, in, in Jung's view, or in my um, appreciation of Jung's view. Um, there is a redemptive quality to his view of uh, evil, and that is if um, the rest of the personality, personality, what he calls the self, which is the coming together of a healthy development, so to speak, closer to what you could probably define as a soul, um, whatever is left in the, um, in the shadow, if it's brought out into consciousness, this would be a, a redeeming aspect of, of it. Then we have um, the work of Eric Fromm. He's obviously influenced by, by Freud and Jung, but Fromm is more interested um, in, in another aspect. He, he postulates that human beings live in a, or, or live in a existential conundrum, if you like. There is a, an existential angst for being in the world, and this angst, the, the, the conflict within the person, seeks resolution mainly in two ways. One is progression, and the other one is regression. Progression, of course, would be a healthy development of the personality, finding purpose in life, relating well to others, to the environment, whereas regression <clears throat> would be to take the other way, self-destructive. And um, Fromm sees that a little, well, a little touch less clinical in the sense that he does believe evil is tragic because it would represent somebody taking the regressive route and trying to rid himself or herself from the burden of existence which would be a, it's, it's a sad, it's a sad thing. From um, does see a, as well a redemptive, redemp, redemptive <coughs> aspect in his theory, and that is um, remorse. He says that even, or maybe we all, all of us go a little back and forth and, and uh, but are m mostly in one certain path, he says. And remorse helps you bring you back if you strayed or if you're, following behind or whatever. So that would be another little piece of information there to keep in mind for when we attack this. <laughs> there is um, the work of Conrad Lorenz. He, was, he studied animal behavior and he found or he, he um, suggested that evil is grounded in aggression. This is a natural aggression, animals have it, but humans uh, in a primal state had checks and balances that could um, keep this aggression in control or balanced. He uh, says that modern societies would actually derail the human aggression and produces all kinds of uh, negative effects. He does offer a little redemptive quality and for him 
it is the possibility of building relationships and friendship. So it says we're not entirely doomed. <laughs> um, and then, just to finish with this little segment of psychology and psychiatry, there's, I, I found the work of a very, a very interesting work of a psychiatrist, an American psychiatrist and an author. Some of you might have read his book, The Road Less Traveled. And um, he approaches evil as well from his private practice and his work with criminals. He has a number of cases and he starts discovering or finding out that there's a personality that does not fit within the normal or regular psychiatric diagnosis. And he starts finding a series of characteristics that make, start, he starts to think that maybe he should be postulating this type of personality because there are similarities um, as, as an evil personality and starts studying the, the topic. He finds out that this type of personalities suffer immensely, although they don't show it. There is a very, very strong internal conflict between an awareness of their failures, normal failures, or their sinfulness, if you like, and the necessity, pathological necessity they have to show an image of absolute moral purity. Um, they do not accept any wrongdoing. He even compares this type of personality with uh, some of the criminals he worked with. He says that the criminals, even those who really did <laughs> atrocious things, sometimes retain a little bit of honesty of what they did, whereas the, the evil personality he's studying goes to any lengths to deny any, any wrongdoing. And that takes, what he says, a lot of scapegoating. So they are never wrong. You have to place the blame somewhere else or do things, whatever. They, they justify themselves in, in such a way. So he, he proposes to... Uh, because he comes from the medical model, he approaches things from the medical model, he, which is seeing the, the, the person in terms of health and disease. He thinks that if he succeeds in incorporating this type of personality within the normal psychiatric, psychiatric uh, structure of uh, diseases, and he proposes to place it under uh, extreme narcissistic disorder because of the uh, attention to oneself and to at the expense of everything else. He, um, he thinks, or he thought, that uh, evil would be more of a research area. It would be a valid research area, which uh, it's difficult to justify in science. And um, that, that would also give doctors the responsibility to heal it or find ways how to deal with, with this, uh, the people that were classified like that. But that's not all because he curiously uh, continued his investigations and found that there was another type of evil and started looking deeper into uh, and training with an exorcist. And here where things are, get a little, <laughs> a little murky and dark and a uh, little scary as well. And I like research, but not that much. So <laughs> I'm going to like to steal more theoretical aspects of it. But, uh, <laughs> He, uh, he actually performs a series of, of exorcisms because, uh, and he in the end concludes and attests to what he says, uh, the existence of the devil. And he writes, there's a book called Glimpses of the Devil where he documents these. It's, um, it's not an easy read and uh, for, <laughs> my, if you, there's a little bit of a, it's intriguing, you start, but then it starts feeling a more, like it's some sort of morbid, a thing and, and anyway, it is interesting though, but uh, I can tell you after reading all those things, I did feel a little depressed for a month or two after. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, so evil has a way of touching you even if you are not, uh, you're not ready for or, or aware of it. I, just as a parenthesis, I would like to, on that note, to mention there are very uh, public personalities around also actually attesting to this. And very seriously, and I can think of a retired general, uh, Romeo Dallaire, Canadian, now a senator, who was the, uh, the head of the UN forces in Rwanda. He, uh, when he came back, he obviously was uh, 
and he says it again uh, also publicly that he suffered extreme uh, post-traumatic di dis uh, distress um, stress disorder, and that, he, that he's struggling with things that he will carry to, to the end of his life. He wrote a book called Shaking Hands with the Devil, and uh, in his tours, a decade ago or something, he, he did publicly state that he had met the devil, and that he, uh, in many occasions, he saw how he operated. He saw people that all of a sudden something happened, and they switched, and they were in a completely, they, they were someone else, and uh, that he could even smell it. So... I'll leave it there, and uh, with, with that, I, I probably would just wrap the, uh, the scientific <laughs> aspect of things. <laughs> but then, i just jump then now to the theological thinking. We saw that that type of approach in, in, in contemporary philosophy is conceptual. Then we saw a little bit of uh, the scientific thinking, and now the theological approach of things. Um, it involves philosophy, of course, but they touch on different traditions, and it, it, it's fascinating also to keep um, those ideas and theological um, postulates in mind. Uh, I would start with the uh, theology of Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo. <laughs> Hippo. Um, he, uh, he's one of the most influential Christian um, theologians, and, and he... It's interesting what he did because he came from different traditions. He broke with them and eventually proposed what, uh, what is studied till, till today in, in, in theology. He, um, he did not believe um, or he did not share the view of the time, that one of the views of the time, that God or the, that the world and the universe is a part of the self-radiation or the emanation of God. So God would be like a light, and as he self-radiates, there the comes into existence the universe and the world. So the more li divine light, the higher the order of creatures. The further away from the light, the less um, desirable creatures, and um, evil starts lurking around those sides where, where the divine light it's not, it's not as intense. For Augustine, this was not acceptable because that meant that within God that there was a principle of evil. So he, he broke off with that, and he said uh, he defended the view that God created the universe and the world from nothing, out of nothing. So God is separate from cr the created order. He's all good and immutable, whereas creation can be <coughs> transformed or can be corrupted. And that's where he places evil. He says that uh, evil appears in, in somehow in the malfunction of the good. When he, he relates, the, um, re relates it to, to morality or, or to human evil, if you like, he, uh, he, he actually says that it's pride what makes people turn away from God. And the... Um, and, um, another interesting thing or important thing about that, his conception is that there's no... Um, in his mind, there was no possibility of an all evil being because evil is a malfunction of the good, therefore dependent on the, on the good. If there's no good or being, there's, not, there, there's no evil. So it's, a very, it's an absurd thing because evil is a parasite and feeds from what he's actually trying to destroy. But anyway, another little piece of information there to keep in mind. If we fast forward to 20th century theology, um, we have theologians like Karl, Karl Barth. He uh, agrees with Augustine. The world was created out of nothing. Um, he actually believes also that this existence can actually collapse into non-being, but this is too theological and uh, take a doctorate to understand properly. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, he agrees the world was created out of nothing. He says that there is a shadow side to creation, which philosophers nowadays agree with him. They say that, uh, going back a little bit, that uh, there is natural evil and there is moral evil. Natural evil would be everything that's related to natural disasters, disease, uh, or normal decay, a part of the, the process of life. And uh, Karl Barth also postulated what he called the shadow side of creation which involves all this. 
And uh, he went also a little further because for him, there was indeed an agent or there was a principle that seeks to negate everything that is or actually to interfere or break the relationship between God and creation. And he called this radical evil. And he gave him a, a name in German that very, sounds very technical. I like it. It's Das Nichtige. So that sounds, uh, and uh, he started stumbling um, with problems with these conceptions because he understood Das Nichtige to be subservient to God with his power allowed by God. So this obviously brings several problems to the table. And God that is all good, how can he allow uh, evil to be done or, or sanction it or anything? So he does accept that uh, evil necessarily falls into a broken discourse, that you have to sustain somehow um, opposing views. And, uh, and this is a long-standing problem in philosophy and theology. There's a, a branch called theodicy, who actually is uh, specifically dedicated in trying to reconcile the understanding of an all-good, all-powerful God with the existence of evil. But I'm not going to get into that. Other uh, theological uh, ways of thinking in the 20th century uh, echo a little bit the, what we've seen in the work of Fromm, for instance. They postulate, this is Paul Tillich, if you're interested, they postulate that, uh, that humans live, if, uh, their, their start point is an existential angst, and that is what is the root of evil and sin. There is a liberation theology that finds the causes of evil in society and, and societal structures that allow some groups to oppress others. And there's a um, um, very interesting branch of theology, it's called process theology, was in, uh, inaugurated by uh, a mathematician and uh, one of the fathers of formal logic, uh, Alfred North Whitehead. And he, he actually breaks away with the uh, world created out of nothing. He believes the, the, or he believed the, work, the world is created out of a primeval chaos and that God set in motion the unfolding of events. That rests the blame, um, keeps the blame of God away from evil because in a way evil is explained by the occurrences of that unfolding. Although in this view, the destiny of all this process is God himself and the world or God is in the world as well, so he's compassionately guiding um, the process onto him. So as you see, when you get into these, um, these things, it's fascinating, but sometimes it's frustrating because one thing creates another problem and you cannot really leave with a clear answer and say this is, a, this is conclusively anything. But the exercise is wonderful, I think. <laughs> yeah. I see sometimes philosophy and, 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 the, and theological thinking as what you would see an athlete running around a football field and say, well, what's the use? You end up in exactly the same place where you started. Yeah, but there are some good things happening to the body and the mind in the process. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so um, well, we've talked um, quite a bit of the lines of thinking and I hope you, you were able to, to see what little pieces of information I was trying to to um, highlight there. Um, now let's look at the prints. Um, but at the time that these prints were, uh, were produced by Delacroix, uh, there had a shift in the way of thinking had already occurred. It's the Romantic period, um, the use of reason, the faith in, in reason, and that reason would explain everything, it's starting to diminish the world of emotions and feelings starting to gain legi le legitimacy. Uh, by the end of the, ninth of the uh, um, 18th century, the philosophy uh, in Germany, or by Kant, had mostly demonstrated that reason cannot know, or through reason you cannot know anything that's beyond the world of experience. So we live uh, our senses, uh, that's how we relate to the world, and we can abstract from there and create concepts of understanding, and that's how reasons, reason works, collaborates with these two aspects of, uh, 
of uh, sensibility and understanding to form judgment. However, if something is beyond experience, the reason cannot, cannot touch it. And of course, that created a series of problems um, with some aspects of religious thinking. Theologians and philosophers st um, started finding other routes to continue that discourse on God. People like Schleiermacher, a uh, German theologian, he, um, he postulated that since you could not know God through reason, uh, you, you would have to go another way and, and found that the ground would be the feeling. Uh, feeling would be the ground on which you can actually discern divine presence. And this is um, also very prevalent in nature, through nature, through active contemplation of nature. You could actually um, discern and feel uh, a divine presence. In France, not, not, only, not only that, reason on the decline, uh, in France, there's the, uh, the strong influence of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He advocated the, the goodness in humans. Uh, he advocated that nature was good. Therefore, instincts are natural. They are good as well, which um, stand, uh, which just stood in, in face of um, what the neoclassical and rational ideals represented on the very first print here. We'll get a little more into that. Used to, um, used to talk about these were ideals of um, objectivity, ideals of um, universal and general, um, like beauty, whereas the romantic thinking is going inwards. It's about feelings and about subjectivity, and uh, they're looking to different sources as well. The neoclassical movement um, bases much of, of, of its models in in Greek and, and Roman, and please correct me if I say, in, in Greek and Roman ideals, the, the Romantic movement has to go somewhere else and starts look, going back, looking for the, root, the roots. And in the case of, uh, of France and uh, other places, they find the Middle Ages a very attractive uh, option. And the Middle Ages, of course, are associated with superstition, with darkness, with witchcraft and all these things. So as you can see, the, the, the prints, the images are staged um, in medieval settings. And this is probably uh, pretty much what Delacroix might have, might have seen during the play. And he was trying to recreate um, in the prints uh, another aspect of, of a romantic um, work like this is it is again, it's staged, and you can see the lighting that he's using. If you compare a little bit with the neoclassical print, where uh, the tones come from light to dark, it's very delicately shaded. It um, obeys an order and a balance and a proportion. The romantic print, it's a quite a little bit different. It's, um, it's quite intense in the, the, the grading, or I would say actually bases it on contrasts, sometimes reminiscent of, of Rembrandt. And again, I say here carefully. <laughs> and, uh, uh, neoclassical prints or works look at the ideal beauty or the ideal of beauty. Delacroix looks at the grotesque horrible things happening here, uh, very much reminiscent perhaps to the uh, Goya's unconscious, let's say. And, uh, but anyway, uh, just getting back to evil and, and Faust. It's commonly known that Faust sold his soul to the devil in exchange of knowledge. What it's not so commonly known, or at least I didn't know it before, before reading the, uh, the, the work, is that in what he found, or what Mephistopheles gave him, was love. He was very happy with that. But in the process, a totally innocent woman and the people around them were absolutely destroyed. So the play is full of uh, humor and wit, but at the same time, it has very, very horrible things happening. And uh, it's deceiving. Mephistopheles always keeps a cynical face. For him, everything is a obviously it's a sport. He has God's approval to actually uh, come and 
get Faust's soul, and he's very happy to try, which raises, again, some theological questions. And with the things we've spoken about, um, you might want to start thinking of where would that fall, where would that belong, or perhaps opening doors to, to study what kinds of, uh, of theology um, or which traditions would deal with, with something like that. Uh, for instance, uh, Faust, the start of the play where we get to meet him, in this print here, he's alone in his chambers, the university, he's a scholar, he's in absolute despair, he has devoted his entire life to the pursuit of knowledge, and he feels he knows nothing. He thinks it's a waste. So can we say that he's departing from an existential um, problem, perhaps? And he has two ways to go, progression or regression. Well, he decides for regression. At that point, right there in the play, what he's thinking and actually doing is preparing to commit suicide. He's done. So he's preparing a drink, and he gets interrupted by a colleague, a scholar colleague of him, who's younger and who's completely fascinated by, by knowledge and by reason and all this. And Faust is, there's no way to console him. He starts going into he, occult practices, conjuring up all kinds of spirits. Eventually, in one day walking around the... Uh, the city gates with his friend or his colleague, he sees that a dog is following them. He brings, he, he comes back to his, to his study, brings the dog in with a little bit of a renewed um, energy to start translating the, the New Testament to German, he says. And the dog starts making a lot of noise, starts turning into a horrible monster, growing to the size of the room and uh, with smoke and everything, I'm just trying to describe the, the effects that Goethe would, <laughs> which is very, uh, After all the smoke dissipates, out comes another scholar, or a student, I believe. But, uh, and uh, Faust says, and who are you? And he replies, really, for someone like you, is the question necessary? So, uh, but th this touches on the fact of, of, of the, that Faust actually didn't believe that the word actually captured the content and the real meaning of things. And, and in the end, he asks again, yes, but you can be this or that, or, or who, are, who, who is it? Who are you of all these evil things or all these, these bad things? And he said, well, I am the principle of perpetual negation of everything that exists. So again, another little window, another thing that may relate to some of the things we, we spoke about with uh, the radical evil. And, and, and anyway, I want to point these uh, to these moments in the play because they, are, they spark the imagination and, and more dialogue around evil. And uh, Of course, uh, if evil is what produces pain and suffering and injustice, Marguerite is the victim on which everything falls on. She falls in love with Faust, although she knows that he is a bit of a shady character, and she absolutely hates his companion. She says, there's something really wrong with that guy. But, and Faust says, no, no, you just don't like him. <laughs> but, but she knows, and she has conversations with Faust about religion where she's trying to get, at, to, to, get to know him better, and she realizes that he's nothing of, like what she expected, and uh, still, she falls in love. So she's the victim in all this. Mephistopheles, while well, he distracts Faust by visiting different places and things, um, he manages to destroy Marguerite and her family. First, uh, there's Marguerite's brother. She knows that her sister has been frequenting this uh, shady character, so he's waiting for him outside. And when they approach one night, he challenges Faust to the duel. And uh, Faust uh, accepts, but you have here Mephistopheles actually blocking the sword thrusts of, uh, of Valentine, Marguerite's brother, just to set the stage of Faust, Faust can he kill him. So he's having fun all the way, but actually destroying lives. They also managed to kill uh, Marguerite's mother through a potion that Faust gave Marguerite. She said, give this to your mom every time I visit you, and she will sleep through the night. And uh, one of those nights, uh, that, uh, she didn't wake up. So again, there's all this 
series of terrible things happening. Um, here is a very sinister scene, that evil spirit sent by Mephistopheles to torture Margaret because she, uh, well, she lost her mom, she lost her brother, and now she knows that she's pregnant, and that's obviously something completely unacceptable in society in those days, in, in the terms that, that she, she got pregnant. Um, Mephistopheles is distracting Faust where, when very important things are occurring, and you just find out later that uh, Marguerite has killed her child, she's imprisoned, and she's going to be executed. At that point, Faust is, uh, demands that he's taken to her, and he's trying to save her, he's trying to free her from her captures, but he, she doesn't even recognize him. She has gone insane, but one thing that remains of, of her character is that she will take the punishment, she's not gonna escape. So again, we have here some uh, redemptive aspects. Faust, you could say that he's full of remorse. I don't know, this is the type of things you want, would like to study more deeply uh, the work to, to answer. But, but, but anyway, I, I hope that the few pieces and bits of information I shared might open up the play and the works by Delacroix a little more. You can enjoy them a little more. That would be, that would be one of the best things tonight. And uh, I would just, for the last word, say uh, something related to, to, well, evil, of course. It's by Viktor Frankl. <laughs> he, uh, most of you might know that he uh, was uh, an intern in the concentration camps. He lived what you could probably say it's one of the highest expressions of moral evil. And he was there, and he was developing these theories within. And he said um, that you don't have control over things, so some things in your life sometimes. And when you find out that your destiny is to suffer, you still have a choice, and that is how to bear the suffering. So with that, I, I, I will leave it there, and I hope you enjoy these wonderful works. Thank you. Thank you. for the live streaming thing, in case you're wondering. Um, does anyone have any questions? Because we have time for a few questions. If you want to think about, think about that for a minute. I'll just thank um, Claude, because um, I feel like we've had a sort of a crash course in uh, the study of evil tonight, which is great. Yeah, it's Some of the, the high points. And um, mm. it's great to bring a new perspective to these works. Um, it's not, you know, art historical, which is the way we normally look at them. And uh, it's just been wonderful. And you packed so much into a short time. Um, does anyone want to comment on the, the prints or ask any questions? Discussion? Well, so did you go to, did you intend that there was a moral to the play? I, that's a very good question. I think he did. Uh, I. I wouldn't be able to comment on the literary aspect, but uh, um, I don't know the, the answer, actually. I, I, I think, oh, obviously, he's, he's studying evil. This is, this is a work he, he uh, composed throughout many, many years, and we, he, would, he did some bits and pieces, then revised it years later, and then many years later he finished it, and only because some, some uh, colleagues were in, in, insisting. So. It does reflect many stages of his life and his thinking, but I, I, I'm really not prepared to, uh, to look deeper into that. Um, I think you said at the beginning that the, the lithographs were not necessarily highly successful in their time, that there was, that there was controversy. Oh, about them. Catherine, I believe, uh, mentioned that uh, if you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. They actually created an uproar. Um, they were considered to be um, an example of what was called or dubbed the Ecole du Lait, the ugly school. And um, mm -hmm. this was um, a kind of extreme version of the steel troubadour, the troubadour style, which started to um, appear in the mid 1820s. And it, it was carried to extremes. As Claude pointed out, there is a, a caricatural quality, a grotesqueness 
to these prints. And um, so the artistic community was really horrified. And uh, Delacroix was pilloried for these prints. Um, but, um, but Goethe thought that Delacroix had captured the uh, spirit of his Faust better than any other artist. And, uh, but um, just to fill in a little bit, um, the background in, um, in the uh, 1830s, there are very few people apparently in, um, in England could read German. And Delacroix saw the Faust production in London at Drury Lane in 1824. And the production um, was partly based on Marlowe's Faust, because mm, of course the English yeah. knew that one, and partly based on Coleridge's translation of the um, prelude to Goethe's Faust into English. But other than Coleridge and Madame de Stael, there were not many people in England, apparently, who were up to translating German or reading the Goethe Faust. And, um, Added to that, at Drury Lane, what they did was they created um, spectacular extravaganzas. Um, I mean, think Princess of Wales. These were the great musicals of the era, and um, uh, they had uh, de Lotherberg creating phenomenal uh, phantasmagorias with stars flying through the sky, and there's a, a particularly famous scene in this, the scene in the, um, on Walpurgisnacht, uh, in the Witch's Hollow, where uh, trees began to move and things began to shake. And, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody went to see this fantastic kind of, uh, you know, it was like going to Phantom of the Opera. And, you know, it's very Victor Hugo in many respects. So, um, it, and then in the middle, there was a ballet. Um, <laughs> So um, I actually have done more, probably more work on this series than anybody uh, that I know, which isn't, uh, has nothing to do with evil, but the sources, because as a student of Lee, Della, uh, Lee Johnson, I was set the job of trying to figure it out. And it turns out that um, um, a lot of these costumes were taken from Shakespeare productions that Delacroix saw at the same time on the same trip to London and not really from the Faust costumes. Um, uh, and I found that out by becoming somewhat acquainted with toy theater prints of the era, which accurately reproduced the costumes and set designs. But the Walpurgisnacht scene was taken from this very famous scene from the Faust that was shown in London. So it's a real kind of, it's a, it's a total act of the imagination of the spirit. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, but he, he really did get that sense of evil in, didn't he? Yeah, it feels dirty, feels dark, feels uh, unsafe. <laughs> but it would seem to me, if anything, that it's the sin of pride that we're dealing with here, isn't it? With Faust, wanting to have all knowledge, and not he, being he happy is. with being uh, confined to... Yes, and he never considers others. In, in his worldview, there's nothing about others or, or, any, or community or anything. It's all about him. Yeah. But you said that he had been given love, the knowledge of love. That, that struck me as very interesting. Yeah, Did he not have that before? Was he just totally tied up in his he head? He was totally tied up in his head, living in, in those four walls. That's what depresses he so, him so much. And uh, the promise of knowledge all of a sudden, he, he gets distracted because he meets Marguerite. Well, obviously, Mephistopheles arranges for, for him to meet Marguerite, and he does it in a very shady manner, of course. Uh, he takes it to a witch, witch's kitchen, and a dialogue with witch and talking monkeys and things like that. Uh, <laughs> Faust sees a reflection in a mirror of a beautiful woman and falls in love with her. And then um, Mephistopheles says, well, yeah, you do. Don't worry, you'll, you're, you'll meet her, or you'll meet someone like her. You, you'll meet like your, your Helen of Troy. So he starts warm, warming him up for, for that, and of course, uh, knowledge starts looking less attractive when you have an image of a beautiful woman there. That's my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he, he eventually takes uh, Faust to where Marguerite is, and he starts courting her, and Mephistopheles helps with, with that. He gives Faust boxes of jewelry with a tremendous amount of jewels, of beautiful jewels that he leaves in secret places so she will find. She finds that, she's completely uh, surprised. Her mother tells her not to, to keep them, takes them away, so he brings another box. And, and of course, Mephistopheles is helping with all the courtship process. And he, 
they do fall in love. She does fall in love with him. And, and that's where her problems start. There's the, the print where she's sitting alone. It's one of the most beautiful and calm prints of the series. And uh, she's just uh, Faust after being with her and everything just decides to take off and go to a cave and live like a hermit for some time. And she's alone. Even Mephistopheles comes to him and says, well, what are you doing? Are you tired of this kind of life? She's waiting for you. She, if she loses uh, or she looks at someone else, it's your fault. So he, <laughs> It is just uh, um, an interesting dynamic, but uh, eventually, of course, he, he is desperate in love with her, but keeps being distracted by, by Mephistopheles at the same time that these horrible things are happening. So, uh, and he, of course, curses the devil, but at this point, there's not much he can do. <laughs> I know there's the second part of Faust, uh, where seems to be, will touch on things about him trying to backtrack from the deal, but I don't know the details. <laughs> <laughs> Are there more questions? I see. Well, I suppose that uh, the question of whether they'd be good without evil is a reasonable question. It's a very good question. Um, process theology, the one I mentioned at the end, says evil is a necessity because uh, God persuades. So you have, as a, as, a, as a human, you have to have the option. Of course, I, I could draw, and there are theologians in the audience, and probably they could find better sources, but this is the one that comes to mind. Uh, you We've could. been given free will. Yeah, yes. So you have to have no the No evil, nothing to choose between, mm -hmm. right? Theology does deal with the deeper aspects of humanity as well, even, even if you don't take into account the, the, the divine or, or anything. It does deal with personhood. And that by itself, uh, you could have a rich theology there without... That's my opinion. And... <laughs> Yes. Um, is it any of this? Is there anything about a collective evil, or is evil always individual? That's a great question. Uh, depends on what school of thinking you have, where the source of evil is located. Uh, if you go to the Jungian theory, for instance, we all have a shadow in the unconscious, and there are wild drives and destructive drives there. Some. Uh, develop that or no, others don't. So perhaps you can theoretically under that theory say, yeah, it's there and there's a collecti collective one or the possibility of turning, uh, turning uh, li like that. No? Uh, but there's many, many theological schools and, um, and, some, and, and philosophy as well, they all emphasize the freedom of will that in the end, like, like what Frankl was saying, in the end there's a choice or the possibility of a choice. So that perhaps will make it individual. But then you get into theories of uh, clinical psychiatry where you say, uh, and the behaviorists where you might say, well, it's really not his or her fault because it is a behavioral thing, it's an evolved thing, it's a natural thing. So the debates are endless. That's why it's, it's great. <laughs> yeah. George? Um, we've been looking at, at the Delacroix and Goya and that sort of thing. And the common thread from the identified people is grotesque, a grotesque group. Now, does the grotesque figure in a, a scale of, of, of philosophical, theological uh, thought? Or is that? simply a product of, of some mad harvest. <laughs> well, I, I think part of the, uh, the romantic movement is, is emphasis on the grotesque and uh, distorted faces and gestures and things. That's one of the things that cause uproar as well. But uh, I rather defer to the experts. How does Francis <laughs> um, well, 
The first question, um, the grotesque, um, is indeed a kind of um, the, the other um, a, a sort of aesthetic pole from um, the classical ideal. And so what Claude, uh, Claude talked about at the very beginning, um, the kind of smooth, kind of perfectly proportioned, balanced, harmonious, classical ideal of neoclassicism was completely uh, uh, overthrown by Delacroix and these highly romantic prints, which just did, undermined the neoclassical uh, aesthetic completely and quite deliberately. Um, and so if, the, if good is the classical mm -hmm. ideal, then yeah. evil is the romantic grotesque. But the mysterious, the, the, the yes. irrational. Right, but yes. the grotesque would be an aesthetic term rather than a, a, mm. a, a theological, philosophical, or scientific term, I would imagine. Yes, and very complicated as well. Yes. <laughs> Um, as for Francis Bacon, um, well, uh, he uses the grotesque, I'm sure, to, uh, to depict evil tendencies. There, it certainly seems to me that uh, um, he depicts evil with greater uh, intensity and, uh, and uh, uh, drama than any other artist of our time. So good is ideal and grotesque is. Yes. Symptomatic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <coughs> well, if there are no more questions, um, thank you so much for coming and do spend time looking at these wonderful prints, yes. which uh, we're absolutely thrilled to have. We have the complete series. Uh, thanks uh, to the uh, gift of Mrs. Lorraine Shuttleworth of London, Ontario, and the Ivy Foundation. Um, and um, it's a great treasure of our print room. Thank you. Oh, here's that. Uh, Sorry, uh, I just wanted to say that we have a piece of paper here, and if you're interested in receiving um, one email a month from the print and drawing department, we will uh, send out like an e-blast once a month to tell you what's happening in prints and drawings, and you can find out about these kind of talks. Um, we also have Wednesday programs and uh, Friday morning talks once a month and different things that we'll just, we just put in one long sort of announcement once a month if you're interested. So uh, there's a piece of paper where you can give us a, your email if, you, if you'd like. And we will be having um, our next talk in February. Um, it's going to be fantastic. Our speakers with us tonight, Erica Ritter, um, is going to be talking about, um, it's called Drawn to Dogs. Maybe I'll just leave you hanging with, on that. <laughs> but I know it's going to be very entertaining, and we're looking forward to it. And thank you so much again, Claude. Thank you. Wonderful. Very much.